PFAS, the so-called forever chemicals, seem to be everywhere, especially in our water supplies. But most people still have no idea what's actually coming out of their taps. So we decided to test the public water supply of one of the largest cities in the US, serving roughly 2 million people for 25 different PFAS. The results? Honestly, they surprised us, pulling us straight into the PFAS rabbit hole. And the deeper we dug, the more unsettling it got. So in this video, we'll show you what we found, why we think that you can't rely on anyone but yourself right now to protect your health, and how you can actually do that, starting today. Hey, Sarah here with BOS Water, and today's video that went in a completely different direction than what we intended. We started out just trying to answer a simple question. Does our own tap water supply contain PFAS? Because a lot of you have asked us to include PFAS reduction in our lab testing for water filters, but to do that, our source water has to contain PFAS in the first place. And so we tested our water supply, which happens to be in San Antonio, home to over 1.5 million people, ranking as the seventh largest city in the US, although the city-owned San Antonio water system actually serves about 2 million people in total. So should those 2 million people be worried about PFAS in their tap water? Based on our test results, surprisingly, no. None of the 25 PFAS we tested for were detected. As you can see in the report, the result column shows ND, meaning not detected. Honestly, we were pretty surprised. Aren't PFAS supposed to be everywhere? And we had hired a certified lab using an approved method to test for 25 different types, including infamous PFOA, PFOS, and Gen X. So we expected to find at least a few. Well, we didn't, which on one hand makes it harder for us to test how well filters remove PFAS. But on the other hand, it seems like great news for San Antonio residents, right? Because at least their tap water is safe. Well, maybe not actually, and that's where we'll enter the PFAS rabbit hole, which led us to realize that whether you live in San Antonio or another big city, a small town, or out in the country, the full magnitude of PFAS contamination might be far greater than the data suggests. And unless regulation catches up, it's really up to us to minimize our own exposure. Now, public water utilities are required by law to monitor the quality of their water. Now, more specifically, they have to collect and test samples for contaminants under EPA regulation, currently a little over 90 substances. If any of those regulated substances are detected, the utility has to include them in its annual water quality report. You may have seen one of these to your own water supply. And if the running average for a detected substance exceeds what's called the maximum contaminant level, the utility is required to take action to reduce it. Now, the EPA only recently started regulating PFAS in April 2024. And while there are an estimated 12,000 to 15,000 different types and that number's still growing, only six have made it onto the EPA's list. Just six out of thousands. That's less than 0.1%, which is a huge problem on its own. And even for those six, the limits are complicated. For example, the EPA set the maximum allowable level for two of the most well-known PFAS, PFOA and PFOS, at four parts per trillion. You can see that number in this official EPA chart. But here's the thing. Those legal limits weren't based purely on health risk. They were also chosen based on feasibility, meaning they also consider technical aspects and potential costs stricter limits would impose on water utilities. In contrast, the health-based ideal for PFOA and PFOS in tap water is literally zero. So your water could contain these chemicals at low levels that still pose a health risk, and your water utility wouldn't be required to do anything about it as long as it stays under that four parts per trillion threshold. And here's the kicker. As far as we know, water utilities aren't even required to include their PFAS test results for the six newly regulated types in their water quality reports until 2027. Bottom line, when it comes to PFAS, your water quality report might be pretty much useless. There's one silver lining though, under something called the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule, Public water utilities, mainly the larger ones, are required to test for a 
bunch of additional unregulated PFAS compounds. To be more precise, between 2023 and 2025, said utilities are required to test for 29 different forever chemicals. The EPA's goal with this is to gather data on how widespread these substances are, which could, at least in theory, result in new regulation down the line. And so this sounds like a step in the right direction, right? Well, here's the catch. The EPA has set minimum reporting levels for all of those 29 PFAS, meaning even if a chemical is detected in a water sample but falls below the set threshold, it doesn't get reported to the EPA, and the utility has no obligation to tell its customers. So once again, that PFAS may never appear in your water quality report. And to make things worse, many, if not most, of those minimum reporting levels seem actually quite high. And I mean, to be fair, the EPA sets thresholds to ensure test results are reliable because Testing for PFAS isn't easy. After all, we're not talking about parts per million or even parts per billion here. We're talking about parts per trillion. For reference, one part per trillion or one PPT is like a single drop of water in 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools. So yes, it's extremely difficult to measure. And that's why the EPA wants to make sure the data is accurate. Now that part makes sense. But the lab we used for this humble little YouTube channel can reliably detect 25 different PFAS down to two parts per trillion. And the lab testing service TAP score even claims they can go as low as one PPT in some cases. Meanwhile, the EPA's minimum reporting levels for those same PFAS are often three, four, or even five PPT. And in one case, as high as 20 PPT. Does that mean our lab is more capable at detecting PFAS than some of the labs used by public water utilities serving thousands or even millions of people? Apparently, yes. The EPA admits this, actually, stating individual laboratories may be able to measure or quantify analytes at lower levels. But those lower levels still won't get reported. And so as part of the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule, only about 2% of nearly 1.5 million water samples tested so far have shown PFAS levels above those reporting thresholds. But how many more samples still contained PFAS in concentrations that could pose a health risk? We don't know. And speaking of health risk, the truth is there just isn't much research on the health effects of the vast majority of PFAS yet. And how could there be? No one even knows their exact number. So how are we supposed to study the short and long-term health impacts of all these chemicals? And because of that lack of research, many PFAS either have no legal limits at all or only very loose ones. And the same goes for public health guidelines. Take PFBS, for example, another type of PFAS. According to the California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, there aren't any studies on whether PFBS causes cancer. So they could only set a non-cancer health protective concentration for drinking water, 500 parts per trillion. But if PFBS does turn out to be carcinogenic, then the safe level for cancer protection might be tens or even hundreds of times lower, just like we've seen with other water contaminants, including PFOA, which has been studied far more extensively. And finally, what we do know is that mixtures of different PFAS can have additive health effects, even if the individual levels detected don't seem all that concerning on their own, which is only more bad news because as we've actually learned from the current unregulated contaminant monitoring rule, PFAS often show up in clusters. In other words, if one type is detected in a water supply, there's a good chance at least one and up to a few others are present as well. Now think about what all of this really means. How many different PFAS might be present in our public water supplies but never tested for? Either because there are simply too many to cover or because testing isn't required in the first place, or both. And how many positive PFAS results go unreported? You could have these chemicals in your tap water right now and your water utility might even know, but if the levels are below the reporting threshold, they're not required to say anything. So you'd never find out and never get the chance to protect yourself. And given how little we know, why aren't EPA and public water utilities more proactive? So instead of waiting to confirm that a specific compound causes cancer or other harm, shouldn't we be treating PFAS as a broader contaminant class and enforcing stricter standards across the board? Unfortunately, the opposite seems to be happening. The EPA recently announced its intent on loosening the few PFAS rules that were just introduced. Why? We can only guess, but we heard that lobbying may have something to do with it. And yes, 
We get it. Water utilities are under pressure. Many are dealing with increasingly polluted source water. Not all of them have the funding or infrastructure to handle it. Plus, some utilities do go above and beyond what's required, which is great to see. But to get back to the San Antonio water system, we looked through all their water quality reports going back to 2013 and found no mention of even a single PFAS until the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule kicked in. Then suddenly three PFAS showed up, PFPEA and PFBA in the 2024 report and PFBS in the 2025 report. That could just be coincidence, but maybe they had never tested for those three chemicals before or they never reported on them. Now we reached out to the San Antonio water system to ask, but so far, haven't been able to speak with anyone who could answer our questions or shed any light on this. But we'll add an update in the video description if we hear back. Either way, wouldn't it make sense to give our water utilities the support and requirements they need to expand PFAS testing and share as much information with the public as possible? Based on everything we've just covered, there's really only one conclusion we've come to. If you want to make sure your tap water contains as little PFAS as possible, you have to take matters into your own hands, at least for now. And there are two ways you can approach this. One, you can try to learn as much as you can about your local water quality first and then decide what to do from there. Or since we can only test for a small fraction of the thousands of known PFAS and because water quality reports might be incomplete or based on flawed data, and because so little is known about the health effects, you can skip the uncertainty and just get a water filter that uses the right treatment methods proven to reduce PFAS. If you wanna start with option one, check your water quality report because it's free and you might already have it and maybe it actually provides some useful insights. But if you don't pay your own water bill, maybe because you live in an apartment, condo or rental, you probably won't have access to a water quality report or there could be other reasons it's hard to get. In that case, we recommend checking the free EWG tap water database. I'm gonna link that in the description. It's basically a massive collection of water quality reports from public water systems all across the US. All you have to do is enter your zip code and select your water utility. You'll then see a full list of detected contaminants split into two categories. Those that exceed the EWG's own health guidelines, which are often much stricter than the EPA's, and all the other substances that were found in your water. And water quality report or not, you should definitely check the TAP score city water project. You just enter your city, select your utility, and you'll get a list of contaminants found not only at the utility level, but also at the TAP, which is really cool. In other words, TAP score city water project combines two data sources, the official data from public water utilities, basically what you'd find in a water quality report, and test results from real people who used TAP scores last service to analyze samples taken from their own faucets. So you'll see two columns, one labeled at the utility and one labeled at the tap. And for each contaminant, you also get a comparison to some of the strictest health guidelines out there, plus extra details like potential health risks. So this can be a super useful tool. And by the way, if you decide to test your own water, you can actually support TAPSCORE City Water Project in the process. The testing still costs the same, but if you're planning to check for PFAS anyway, using TAPSCORE means your results, anonymized of course, could help improve the database and benefit others too. And also we've used TAPSCORE's lab testing service before and and definitely recommend it for PFAS. Their sampling instructions are generally easy to follow, even if you're a beginner, and their reports are clear and detailed. Plus, TAPSCORE's PFAS test kits offer competitive pricing, especially if you go with this kit called PFAS Water Test, covering 14 different forever chemicals. Or you could go with the Gen X and PFAS Water Test Kit, which covers 25 PFAS. Two kits we would not recommend are the EPA 1633 PFAS Water Test and the EPA 8327 PFAS Screen Water Test, because while they test far more PFAS types and cost less, they tend to lack precision, which means they might miss smaller but still relevant traces of contamination. And this is also something you should look out for in case you don't use TAPSCORE but another testing service. Always be sure to check the reporting limits. That's the lowest concentration a lab can reliably measure. One lab might detect down to one part per trillion, while another might only go as low as eight PPT. And that's a big difference when you're dealing with something this trace level. So yeah, realistically, 
getting one of these test kits is about the most you can do to test your own water for PFAS. And at least for TAP score, their kits come with everything you need to take a proper sample without accidental cross-contamination. For example, you have to wear gloves while sampling, but can't use latex because that could introduce PFAS into the sample. And so TAP score includes gloves in the package, which I believe to be nylon. They also include return shipping, which is important because PFAS samples need to be shipped quickly and kept cool using ice packs, which adds to the cost. And finally, if you do go with TAP score, we've got a $10 discount code you can use. And I'll include that along with all the links in the description. All right, let's say you've tested your tap water for PFAS and found something, or you wanna filter it anyway just to be safe. Well, the good news is removing PFAS from your home's tap water is actually pretty doable. There are four treatment methods you can use. Reverse osmosis, which based on our research yields by far the best results for both short and long chain PFAS, so basically for all of them. Activated carbon, which is effective for long chain PFAS, but not always as reliable with short chain ones. And also an ion exchange and nanofiltration. Now we haven't yet tested any filters ourselves specifically for PFAS reduction. So in this case, we lean on NSF certifications to guide us. However, filters certified for total PFAS reduction, so reduction of both long and short chain PFAS, are still pretty limited. And that's because until recently, this kind of certification didn't even exist. And manufacturers could only get their filter certified for reducing PFOA and PFOS specifically. And frankly, we're not huge fans of most of the certified filters we've found so far, but we'd expect more products to get certified soon. And again, PFAS aren't actually that hard to remove as long as the right treatment method is used. So personally, we'd go with a reverse osmosis system because again, it yields the best results and most home RO systems use activated carbon pre and post filter stages. So you get both technologies in one setup. Plus in our lab testing for a wide range of common tap water contaminants, RO systems consistently outperform non-RO filters. So you're not just removing PFAS, you're getting cleaner water across the board. If you're interested, we've already tested a bunch of RO systems on our channel. We have a comparison of 11 under sink models and another one for 10 countertop systems. So if you're looking for the best RO setup for your home, those videos are a great place to start and I'll link both of them in the description. And if you're not into reverse osmosis, a simpler option would be the new Culligan pitcher based on zero water filter technology. It combines activated carbon with ion exchange resin. And while we haven't tested the pitcher ourselves yet, so we can't speak to things like usability, it is certified for 99.7% total PFAS reduction. Just know the rated filter capacity is only 20 gallons, so you'll need to replace the cartridge regularly. If you don't, the PFAS reduction may not stay as effective. And we'll leave it at that because we don't want this video to feel like it was just a setup to promote water filters. Looking ahead, we still plan to test how well different water filters reduce PFAS, but real testing only works if we can use water that contains stable, measurable levels of specific PFAS compounds. Without that consistency, we'd just be comparing apples to oranges and the results wouldn't mean much. But we're confident that we'll figure something out. So stay tuned and remember to subscribe to our channel. Also, please give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and drop any thoughts or questions in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.